morning everybody we're going to start with unit 3 today we're going to have a look at lesson 1 and we're going to discover what is object orientated programming classes and objects Zim is joining us today sitting on my shoulder we will need to ask him afterwards if he understands what I said I'm mainly going to have a look first of all at structured programming that's sort of the programming that you did up until now then what is object orientated programming I'm going to have a look at the difference between classes and objects what's all, what are the different parts of the class that we need to have a look at and know about objects and then finally how the application is going to use these classes and objects um, I will do a full example in the next video so first of all let's have a look at some programming paradigms so ways to program really up until now you guys used what is called structured programming without really knowing about it structured programming it's when we use structured control flow so selection repetition blocks and subroutines procedures and functions to form the basis of our programs so um, the program will start at a certain point when the user clicked on some button let's say and then the flow of control is um, directed from there onwards all the data is stored in the application itself and normally in the button event procedure as local variables and if I need to store data of an employee in one application and another application needs to use that data again I need to duplicate everything and now that's the bad thing about structured programming if I've got a huge set of programs which all uses let's say employee data I've got to duplicate quite a few variables and um, different methods so object oriented programming makes this task a little bit easier object oriented programming is all about the data and the code of an entity so an entity can be anything like a product or an employee or a student or um, um, items that I sell in my store okay and now we are first of all going to use units so I'm going to have this unit called client maybe that stores data of the client and that provides functionality of the client and I will have another unit these units are called classes and we we are let's say product class and I will specify the data of a product and the functionality that can happen with a product so now after I've specified that I can code my application the application will simply say I'm going to use a client or a product and the data is already specified and the functionality thereof is already specified in object orientated programming we then will first of all specify classes these classes will store data and procedures which we normally call methods now and this will store data of a specific type of entity so clients as I said or students or products all the data and the functionality regarding that my program my application will then use objects its instances of a class um, to store the data and to do the actual programming 
So first of all, I tried to give you a little bit of an explanation as to the two different types of programming. Structured programming, which formed the basis of what you did and in development software and in logic up until now, um, where each individual program is its own container for data and it's also a container for the functionality, the procedures and the functions. Visual Basic, the way that we used it in the .NET environment, is not all just structured. Every text box, every label, every button that you used were classes. The moment you dragged and dropped and put a label or a text box or a button or any other control on the form, you actually did use some object oriented programming as well. So we will um, find a few points that you can relate to and that would be easier for you to understand as we go along. So object oriented programming, as I said, new way of thinking about the data. And it's real difficult right at the start for students. So this might take a bit of your time okay, to get used to the way of thinking. So I am going to store units of data really and think of the text box and the label. So if I dragged and dropped and put a text box on the screen, it was a little thingy that worked. The user could type in data without me, the programmer, doing anything. And that's one of the beauties of object oriented programming. Somebody else provided the functionality and the properties for a text box and I can just use it. I can use all the different properties of a text box and I can call the clear method that somebody coded already. Okay, so now it's time to have a good look at the theory now that we sort of have an idea. So first of all, we need to know about a class. Real important. <coughs> a class specifies then two things, data and behavior. So data and behavior are the general object oriented terms. If you talk about data and behavior, the programming language that you use is not important. We can use Java, we can use we can use VB.NET, everybody understands data and behavior. In the VB.NET environment, data would normally be called member variables. So when we talk about member variables, we are aiming now specifically at VB. And then we can talk about methods for the behavior, the things that we can do. And again, in a more VB.NET environment, Although languages like Java also uses methods similarly. Okay, so a class is one little piece of code that specifies two things for us. What data I want to store and what I need to be able to do with the data. So I can have a client class, for example, and I want to store the surname of a client, the count number of a client, and the balance of a client. These would be now the data, the member variables of the client. And then we might need to provide some behavior, some methods. So a client can buy an account, and a client can open a new account, and a client can pay off his account. So these are the behavior or the methods that we would provide for a client. object. This is an instance of a class. That's the technical term for an object. I s found that students struggle a little bit with that word. So my definition would be it's a runtime creation of a class. So an object is a runtime creation. My application will use objects. They will create at runtime an object of the class. This object will store data and I can run the methods.
of the class you can execute them so a class is really a new type that's created that specifies data and behavior properties and the methods of a text box a good example text box was a class it is a class somebody coded it and it's available for us when I drag and drop a text box onto the screen I can use its properties and I can change them and I can use its methods there's a clear method that you used before for a text box so class will specify what data and how we will process the data so I might have a person class that stores a name and an age and then a have birthday method and the have birthday method will increase the age in a very very simple example okay more further explanation as to classes and objects class you can very often think of as the cookie cutter so Christmas time your mum wants to make some cookies and she would maybe pick a little heart shape whatever size she needs she'd make some dough roll it out and now take the cookie cutter and press into the dough and that will create little cookies biscuits of exactly the same size and shape why because she used a mold a cookie cutter for that and in exactly the same way we can see our classes as cookie cutters and the objects as the cookies the biscuits that we created from the class another example this time around we might have a person class so it sort of looks the same as a gingerbread man shape my person class will store data name and an age for example <coughs> if I now create objects I can call these just object 1 object person 2 and object person 3 for now the important thing to know is each one of these objects will have a name and an age pretty much exactly the same as us humans we all have a name and an age our names are different though and this is now the nice thing about objects I can create objects as many as I need to each object will have individual data each object will have its own data it will have a name that's a string and it will have an age that's an integer but three different persons standing next to one another will definitely have different names and different ages and exactly the same can happen with my objects so every object will have its own data what data the data specified by the class so the class just says there's got to be a name there's got to be an age when I create the object when my application runs and it creates the object when somebody clicked on a button that says create person they would have typed in the name and the age in text boxes when they create click on that button to create the person we take the data from the text box and create the person object and now the person object will have that specific data so every object will store the data specified by the class so name and age for example the objects will have unique values for the data and the objects will be able to do the things the behavior specified in the methods of the class so if I provided a half birthday method I can call it for my three objects and that will increase John's age to 21 Sue's age to 19 and Mary's age to 22 okay the half birthday method will increase the age to what depends on what data is stored for each of the objects so John had a age of 20 if I call half birthday 
his age will be increased to 21. Sue's age will also be increased, Mary's age will also be increased, but their specific data belongs to them and it would be increased according to their ages. We then very often use what is called a UML diagram to specify a class. So UML just means Unified Modeling Language. It's a standard way across, across the globe that all programmers use to specify classes. And it's got three main sections. First of all, the name of the class. Then I specify what data I've got. So what member variables we need in VB. And thereafter, we're going to specify the behavior or the methods. You'll see that there's a little plus or a minus sign before each of those things. My data will always be private. That's what the minus means. So data must be protected by the class. Nobody can just change the age to 5,000. That would be a wrong age. We all know that. So the class must protect the data. It will do some checking, some validations before data is assigned. It must be private, minus in front. The methods, the behavior, other people need to be able to call it. So these are public. There's um, two website <coughs> sorry, links that we can go have a look at. Um, so UML notation to specify a class tells me what data, what attributes, member variables then. And we can be a little bit general or we can be a little bit specific. So here it says length must be an integer. On the left hand side, just the length. You can choose whether it's an integer or a double. And over here they specified which behavior methods must be provided and um, this is actually specified in either C or Java or C++ because int and void are Java and C++ things so it just means this mu length must be an integer get length will send back an integer set length will take an integer parameter and it will work like a procedure, it's not going to return any data. We'll see some VB examples just now. So the name of the class appears right at the top. These are shape classes. The attributes, the member variables are shown in the second partition. The type would be shown after a column and the attributes map to the member variables in the code and then I've got other operations my methods my behavior so they are shown in the third partition these are the methods the, the things I can call for the class sometimes they would have a return type when we need to go to function that would be after a colon at the end of the method signature so this int that I've got over here tells me get length must be a function. Oh, here they've got an example. And the return type of the method parameters are shown. We're not going to use that. All our methods parameters would be value parameters that we code in a class. Okay? because we're just beginners. UML diagrams can be nice and complicated after a while. So over here I've got one, two, three, four, five different classes that's used in my application. I can see it's something about a shopping cart. So might be some um, application that allows the users to order things and buy them and 
there's only a little bit of the data over here if I've got a real life application I might have many different um, member variables and many different behavior methods specified okay and then over here they show relationships between the different classes we're not going to work with that at all this semester so we will concentrate only on a customer class for now to do our programming the two websites that I've opened are available here at the bottom of the um, page so if I can have a look then at the different parts of a class then I will have more or less one, two, three, four, five different sections. Really, really important sections. First of all, I will need my member variables. This would now be one member variable per data item that the class needs to store. So if I need to store a surname and a balance, then my class needs to specify two member variables. One that's called surname, and the other that's called balance. I will have properties. One property per member variable. And these properties will allow me to change or get the data. If you think about a text box. I could call txt um, age.txt and I could save that in a age variable. I must probably write some code like that. This is a property provided by whoever coded the text box class. It allows me to get the current data type into the text box okay so this would be the get property it allows me to get the data but in much the same way I can specify that um, let's just do it like this that I want to display a specific value in a text box so over here where I change the data the set property is used okay if they were not provided I won't be able to do these two things that you find so so uh, commonly used in your programming okay so the properties allows me to change the data and to get the data then I will have constructors so a constructor its purpose <coughs> would be to create an object a constructor must create an object and I will have normally two constructors one that doesn't get any parameters it's called the default constructor and it just creates a default um, object pretty much exactly the same as what you did when you dragged and dropped a text box from the toolbox onto your screen the default constructor would automatically be used in that case and I've got a text box with starting data the name would be text box 1 the text property would be something also like text box one we can also normally specify a second constructor we can call this parameterized constructor just so that we all know what we're talking about and this one gets parameters with the initial data that we need to assign to the different properties so the initial data that the class needs to store 
then I'm going to provide methods and these would now either be procedures or functions that my class needs so things that I need to do regarding the processing of this specific object lastly we're normally going to override the term used the two string method we're going to provide a two string method but this must be a standardized two string method so it can't be just our own we override one that's already given so we redefine that's what override means a class whenever I code a class our classes in VB and most of the other languages will already have a little bit of data not a lot but a little bit and these they will get from what is called the object class object is the parent of all classes in most of the programming languages that we use so that object class specifies a two string method but it's blank because the object doesn't have any data so if we want to redefine the two string method we will override it and obviously we will show you how to do all of these things but first of all you need to know about the one two three four five things that a class must have member variables properties constructors methods and a two string method member variables this would be the data that the class stores properties I will get one property for each member variable the property will have two sections normally a get and a set section the properties are used to directly change or access get the data exactly in the same manner that we got the data or changed the data for a text box I will always provide a default constructor and a constructor with parameters for my class <coughs> the constructors are used to create objects so they're very very important they create objects and they specify the initial data so the default constructor will just use some default blank data pretty much exactly the same as the text box if I drag and drop it on the screen the default constructor would have called the first text box text box 1 and its text would have been text box 1 the second text box is called text box 2 and its text would also be text box 2 that was the job of the default constructor I will have a parameterized constructor a second constructor we can also provide third and fourth constructors as well but for beginners I presume we're just going to start with only one extra constructor one that gets some parameters and over here the parameters will give me the specific initial data that the user entered so if I've got a client what would be that client's surname what would be that client's account number for example so my initial data I will specify methods these will either be procedures or functions for the class and they will now process the data so I will allow clients to buy on account and to pay off their account for example and lastly we will provide a two string method technical term for that to say we override the two string method that's to say we recode the two string method we don't want to use the two string method in the parent the object class we want to give our own two string method that returns the data of this class whatever this class's data would be let's just have a look at the axis so the member variables will always be private we saw the minus the in the UML diagram nobody but this class must be able to use it all the other things would normally be public <coughs> so the properties the constructors the methods the two string method 
I sometimes would later on be able to provide methods that, that's private if only this class must use it. But your first beginner programs would only have public methods. The private member variables belongs to then only this object. Nobody else can change them. Applications, take note, will use the public properties, the public constructors, the public methods of an object. And before all of those can be used, we will first need to create an object from the class. Okay? So there's quite a few steps that we need to know about. So in the source code, I will have always private member variables and I will provide public get and set properties, one per member variable. The set property will do my validation and all the other methods will need to use the properties. So my constructors, my methods and the two string method will use the properties. <coughs> Only the set and the get properties will directly access the member variables. The set property will have some validations to check that the data is good. So I can't assign 5000 to the age of a person because that's not a valid value. We need to always check the user's data. So we need some validations. The properties do the validations, so all my different methods must always use the properties. Over here we've got a student class that's a little bit more detailed now. So I can see that there's four member variables, surname, test 1, 2 and 3. The tests must be integer, the surname is string. There's a public method calculate semester mark that sends back an integer so this will be coded as a function a eh? when a method must send back data it is a function <coughs> there's also a public increase test that doesn't send back data so this must be coded as a sub procedure in vb it takes two parameters the test number and the percentage that we're going to increase the specific test width okay so these parameter names nice and descriptive so that I can see what they mean normally we're not just going to give the UML diagram we're also going to give you a description verbal or written down description of the clause Apologies. Okay, so now the important part. My application is going to create an object from the class. And let's say we wanted to store Sue Mot Long. Then we can think of the object as something like a big wagon wheel. On the inside, we've got the projected data. So we've got the surname and the three test marks. And right at the start, the test marks are zeros. We didn't add any tests yet. And all my properties, my constructors and my methods, they are all on the outside because they are public. The data is protected. It's private. It's on the inside. Nobody can just access it. All my properties and my methods down the outside, they are accessible from the outside onwards. If I just go to the next page. I've got some arrows here to show you how things sort of will work. The constructors, they're always called new. So this is the default constructor, it doesn't get parameters. And I've got a constructor that gets the first, the initial surname. 
and these will change constructors will just change the data so they've got green arrows pointing inwards so they're changing the data properties have got either a change or a give me data axis you can call it okay a property I can either get the data or change the data so properties normally can go either way it can change the data or it can give back the data surname the test one two and three properties the two string method will just send the current data away okay it's never going to change data my increase test method get some parameters and now the code in increase test will change one of the test values by a certain percentage I get other methods that will just take some data it takes the three tests marks calculate the semester mark and send back the semester mark so the methods will some of them will just send back data others will update the data the properties will normally do both update and give me the data the constructors will only always change the data because it's got to store the initial data that we've got in VB we're now going to define an object like this so we're going to have a variable and this is would be a local variable hey because it's got a dim statement I want us to use OBG in front always so that we know we're working with an object so object student as a student this defines object student as a variable that can store an object when I create the object I need to call new so object student is equal to new student and give the initial data this initial data very often will come from a text box hey? not be coded like this in the program so the moment that I call new I create the object and hopefully immediately there's a little bell that rings can you remember that we used new before think a bit in program 14 in the example long long ago from menus we did something like this when we create a new child form we used new and now you know exactly that we created an object of form big Latin words so over here we created an object using the default constructor that would automatically add that part over there we didn't worry about it because it's added automatically so here we created an object we called it form child and it was of the type new means create a new object and what form form pick Latin words so we used this once before or quite a few times if you've had different menus our VB code would normally be uh, to create an object consist of two sections at the top of the method we will define the object variable and then after we got the data from the text boxes we will create the object as you saw with the form we can at one using one command immediately create an object as well this is a little bit difficult if we've got text boxes if we just use the default constructor it's okay but 
I'd say about 90% of your programs will have two different instructions. One to declare the variable, not always as a local variable, we can declare it in a module as well. And another instruction to create the object when the save object or something like that button is selected. So, after we coded classes, then we'll we code an application. My application will create the student object from the data entered normally by the user. So the student's name, and we would most probably want zeros for the tests initially. And then the application will allow us to update the student data to store the different test marks for a student, to view, <coughs> to display a semester mark, or to increase the mark for a specific test. Take note of the following. We cannot allow the user to use an object before it's created. Otherwise, my program will have a runtime error. So the menu or the button options for these things would normally initially be disabled for the user. The user won't be able to click on it or execute it. Very often I like to disable things. The user can see it's there, but the user can't use, use it yet. Only after the data of a student is saved the object is created by the program will we allow the user to do the things that they want to do with the student so we need to create an object first before we can display the semester mark or update the test marks or stuff like that okay I hope this uh, explanation was useful thank you